Red Raygon Limited presents the Benji, the Benji and Nick Show. What, that will be a title sequence one day, won't it? You know, it'll yes. be that'll be a proper impressive things whizzing around sort of scenario. But this week, unfortunately, we've not got around to doing that. So uh, yeah. until then, uh, hello, hello, good morning, good day, good arg, good afternoon, good eve, good night, good. Oh, Ness. Luckness. What is going well done, on? well done. It was wow. I was trying to, I was trying too hard to deceive and thus succumbed right. to my own wit. Well, oh. that was the Loch Ness game. It's not a game and it's not about Loch Ness. But this is the Benji and Nick Show, your number one, number one, number uno uh, vintage television podcast in the known world, not the unknown world. The unknown world, I mean, there could be anything. There could be a zebra podcast where they just talk Definitely, about fish yeah. or something, you know. Yeah, like um, but this is vintage TV, you know, TV from the past, TV that you might you might have forgotten about, TV you might remember and want to chat about. We, we basically watch it, let you know what we think and if you should actually bother, quite frankly. Uh, what yeah, are we exactly. doing this week, Nick? Well, I'd just like to say that I'm not Benji. I'd just like to say that I will get that right one day. I'm not Nick. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, no one ever wrote it down. Um, uh, we are talking about Red Dwarf. We are indeed. Yes, Shelley Dean, our reviewer from Over the Seas, will be reviewing that with us. It was her recommendation, actually, this time round. So we, of Ross course, all obliged. Her yes. <laughs> yes, and uh, you'll see what we think of Red Dwarf. We're actually covering... Um, the the first episode of the third series of Red Dwarf backwards, which I know is a a strange choice because we normally do the first episode of it, but um, oh well, we'll talk about this when we get yes, to it. Yes, we will. We will. To it's to woo. And before we get to uh, Shelley, who will be talking also about our Patreon page and stuff like that, um, we're going to read out some emails that some of you have sent in to us to podcast at nicholasbriggs dot. Com. That is the address to send your emails. To, please inundate us with emails and we'll read them out. And um, what are we going to give a prize to someone or something? Or you just say we gave a round of applause, weren't we? Oh. We've, we've done that. But yeah, then that, we'll do it again. Why not? If you send us in an email and we pick it out, we'll give you a round of applause. <sighs> Happens. Well, now, this email, I'll read this one first. It's, uh, I've got this spooky feeling that I read it out last week. See what you think. Nigel Neal and science fiction fans. Does that ring a bell to you? It doesn't it doesn't because we've had a few different Nigel Neal sort of things. I don't think I don't think we have read this one out because it features the word Brighton, and I think I would have remembered a Brighton based. <laughs> would you? Then? Yes, I, I always remember a Brighton. I do. It's local, mate. It's local. I remember like me locals. Sort of euphemism, doesn't it? Have you got a bit of a Brighton there, mate? Well, you got Steady a bit of Brighton based going on. Still, ooh, ooh, uh. Right, so, Nick, take us away. This was set on the 25th of May in the year 1735. Can't imagine what was going on in 1735. I'll find um, out. Uh, Kenneth Mann, he says, I remember watching Kinvig. This was a Nigel Neal comedy. Poor thing. It's called Poor thing. N Nigel Neal and science fiction fans, he said. Uh, I remember watching Kinvig on original broadcast and being reasonably entertained. Uh, Benji really hated it, and I rubbish more, more or less hate it. He's, he's quite vociferous about it, uh, possibly mostly by the performances of the leads. Though I do remember one joke from it, despite not having seen it from that day to this. I think I didn't realize that Kinvig was supposed to be a generic science fiction fan. Surprisingly, Nigel Neal's main exposure to fandom was at the 1979 World Science Fiction Convention in Brighton. Uh, which Benji gets very excited about that being mentioned. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> Cue Benji's excitement. Um, World cons are primarily festivals of literary science fiction, though in 1979 there would still have been a thriving media track, which would not be the case at a contemporary convention thanks to the relatively easy availability of media. In 1979, if you wanted to see an episode of The Prisoner, you went to a specially arranged cinema showing, and conventions were a place where you could see obscurities. His impression of the fans is puzzling. For example, fancy dress at world cons is comparatively mi a minor thing, except for the traditional evening masquerade competition, which most of the attending fans are watching rather than participating in. Yet he mentioned in an interview that they were all wearing crazy outfits. Uh, did anyone ever see what Nigel Neal wore? Uh, Kinvig is in the strange position of being a satire of a non-existent category that Neal has invented himself. I'm sure there is plenty in fandom to be satirical about, but he doesn't know that 
that world so doesn't strike any targets. Really good point, Kenneth, I think. The guest of honour that year was Brian Aldiss and Fritz Lieber. Uh, perhaps not being the main event annoyed him, <laughs> though I'm not <laughs> sure the room was packed. Uh, returning to my big board of pictures and string, I find that Fritz Lieber wrote Kunja Wife, which was adapted into the film of Night of the Eagle, starring Peter Wingard and featuring Colin oh, and Gordon and an eagle, uh, featuring Colin Gordon and Anthony Nichols, two number twos and the heads of Nemesis in the same film. That's value for money. Yeah, you see, oh, Anthony yeah. Nichols was Tremaine in The Champions. Regards, <laughs> Ken Man. I love what he puts at the bottom of his email. email. Ringstone round. Does that mean anything to you, Benji? It rings a bell, but I can't, I can't place it in my mind. It's that final Quatermass one uh, starring... Uh, Sir John Mills as Quatermass and Ringstone oh, Round is one of the places where people are Ringstone zapped and taken round. up. Do, 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 Ringstone <laughs> Round. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that's okay. Well, see, this is what, what our audience is all about. It's the obscurities that we love. Well, um, talking of which, you better read this out. <laughs> well, I will do. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say, in, in yes. that uh, email there, uh, 1735, I decided to have a look what was going on. And it yeah. actually amused me how not a lot really happened. <laughs> Is that what it says <laughs> it was on like, Wikipedia? It was, not it was pretty lot. much, a, it was a really boring year. I mean, like, honestly, <laughs> listen to these. These are just entries. Like, oh, oh, yeah, Lovely. that, you know, Alexander Pope's poem, Epistle of Dr. Arbonaut, was published. Mm -hmm. uh, Handel's opera, uh, Aria Dante was published. Well, London premiere of something else by Handel. Um, well there was Important one religious Handel conversion. Fans. Yeah, it's a good. Yeah, I suppose it is really. Um, well, we bought some new handles called... for the doors in the house. First exp explanation of the trade winds. Robert Walpole moves into Ten Downing Street. Second Important. successful appendectomy, which is quite exciting. That My favourite one here is here's an interesting one. Here is Charles M Charles Macklin unintentionally kills fellow actor Thomas Hallam after a dispute during a, a performance of the Theatre Royal on Jury Lane. Uh, he's later tried and convicted of manslaughter. But that's pretty much all that happened. I mean, it's not a lot. That's. I wonder how he unintentionally killed him. <laughs> There's a trap. Oh, no. <laughs> you wouldn't get that's manslaughter it. for that. Well, maybe he pushed him. There's a trap. <laughs> that's murder, then. Not that, what if it's there's a trap door? He didn't, you know, he didn't know he was there. I don't know. It's a very tricky one, isn't it? Really. Well, my lad, I moved to. Uh... Maybe he was holding a ladder, you know. Well, my lad, turn round. The classic slapstick thing knocked him down a trap door. Um, I just want, I just want a trap door to be it involved. Has to be a trap door in this anecdote, doesn't it? No matter what. No matter what. And we've got a trapdoor here from Thomas Hodden, actually. The subject of this okay. one is Zippy Squits. Of course it is, Thomas Hodden. Of course it is. Sent on the 27th of the 5th, 2021, a year our Lord, 1705. We're a bit 17-ish today. Yeah, right. um, I certainly am mentally. <laughs> Dear Benji and Nick, just a quick suggestion for the show, which you could do an episode comparing the Britbox remake of The Beast, Beast, Must Die, Die, uh, to the 1974 original, which is just called The Beast, Must Die. Um, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Just don't spoil the new one to me. I don't want to know if I'm right until after the werewolf break. There we go. Yours, T.E. Hodden. Do, Gosh, do the beast do must die. Do you understand any of that? I've I vaguely recommend, you know, the beast must die is something I'm not massively familiar with, as you'll know. Well, I don't, um, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the 1974 original is. The beast must die is a Brit box um, original. And it's, it sounds not like a a... it's not a remake of anything. He's having a laugh here. It's a crime thriller about a woman whose child has died and she goes to the Isle of Wight to find the murderer because the police won't uh, do anything about it. A guy there, basically... there is, there, But there is a 1974 film called The Beast Must Die. And what's it about? A werewolf, hence the wolf. Millionaire big game hunter gathers six people at his remote English mansion. I oh, was one of those films announcing that he suspects that one of them is a werewolf. The viewer is invited to unfold the mystery along with the characters. Near the end, there is a 30 second pause uh, called the werewolf break where the audience uh, is. Oh, wow. The audience is asked to guess the werewolf's identity uh, based <laughs> on the clues in the movie. How funny is that? You see, that Thomas, you have a break. educated us beautifully here. Yes. The Beast Must Die on Britbox is nothing to do with that. But that is the joke that Thomas is making. That is, I feel. Well, it, well, it makes sense. 
I used to love a good interval in, at the cinema because then if you're yeah. watching something like, I don't know, Pirates of the Caribbean 3, uh, which home. I was dragged to by my ex-girlfriend and I didn't really want to see, um, I just said, I'm not going back in. It's rubbish. Let's do something else. Call I did boring. that with Superman 2. Superman 2. Well, sometimes you well, just think, Superman what's the point? 3. It might be it's Superman 3. It was Superman 3, the comedy one. And I just, yeah, it was an interval. And I just said, this is just awful, isn't it? Let's just go home. Let's do something else. Use my time in a better way. And I remember actually what we did end up doing. I won't mention that. Um, Golf. His, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, subject, Z cars and how we approach offensive material in older programs. Mm, this is heavy it's from Chris Avery, sent on the 14th of May. Avery. Uh, in the <laughs> year 0815. Dear Shelley, Nick and Benji, thank you for another entertaining podcast last week. Well, as I say, this is from a few weeks back. The podcast reached new heights when Shelley joined the team and the weekly transatlantic cross-cultural confusion and indeed contusion is always <laughs> great. Following on, because we're always going, no, well, in the States, no, well, in the, yeah, it goes like that the whole time, doesn't it? Uh, following on from last week's edition, I watched Zed Cars episode one and thoroughly enjoyed it. I think listeners will remember that that uh, Shelley hated it. I mean, she really hated it, didn't she? Not her, I, it was a different world, isn't it? Different world. I loved it. Like big time, you know. If it was Z Z cars and it was all based in a sort of, you know, Illinois-based <laughs> sort of cop scenario, it might have been different. Gosh, if it had been like, uh, I'd, have you ever seen End of Watch with Jake Gill <laughs> no. Gillen? Gillen I've What's seen clips. Name? I've seen clips of it. I've seen wow. clips of it. I've never it's sat down harsh. and actually watched it. I couldn't watch it all in one go because it's so upsetting. And there's actually a sequence of it. I just turned the brightness down on my computer because I couldn't bear to see it. It was set at night as well, that bit, and it's just horrific. But it's brilliantly... <laughs> what's his name? Jake Gillen, Gillen? I can't remember his name. Do you know what I mean? No, uh, sort of. Really I've seen famous. bits. I'm not, I'm not an informed... He's been, in, an informed. he's been in loads of movies. Oh, we'll have to ask Shelley. We'll forget. Although much younger than Nick, I was born in September 62. Haha, <laughs> winky face. Yeah, well, that's a year later than I was born. I do remember Zed Cars being part of our weekly viewing, but not this lineup. Although I do remember Lynch, everyone, yeah, Barlow and Watts as they continued for a while. It was also good to see Bernard Kay turn up in a small role alongside Derek Waring as car thieves. Yeah, hilarious. Derek Waring from Havoc. I, you just knew a fight was going to kick off the moment Derek Waring turns up because he's a <laughs> But he's also a good actor as well. I was also surprised by the characterization of Lynch, who I remember as the steady, reliable desk sergeant, not the this young chancer. Exactly. Really matured over the years. Anyway, on to the point of the email. We're over halfway through the email, Chris, and you only just got to the point. <laughs> A regular topic of conversation on the podcast is attitudes displayed in vintage TV and to what extent do we make allowances for the racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. as being how things were back then in the name of nostalgia and otherwise good entertainment. I have just had a debate on a Doctor Who Facebook group. Oh, God. Here we go. It's Gallifrey, oh, Gallifrey base opening up here. Uh, yeah, about a sketch for comic relief, which for lots of us was deemed to be riddled with misogynistic attitudes and stereotyping. The sketch in question featured the Doctor, Amy and Rory uh, team, so was made around 10 years ago. So my question, and I would really be interested in your opinions, is what is the cutoff point at which we say, uh, no, there is no excuse for this? Uh, they did know better. Regards, Chris Avery, sent from my idealistic bubble that transcends the boundaries of space and time. What's your opinion, Benji? It's a really difficult one, isn't it, when it comes to things like that. I, do you know what? I suppose yeah. it's a tough one because one has to take into account the world was was still not quite as, as extreme as it is now 10 years ago in terms of what we will put up with and what we won't. You know, is mm. it acceptable? I don't know. I don't I've not I can't remember the, the context of the sketch. No, I uh, as to no. what I don't it is. Remember anything about it. In fact, I don't think I ever actually saw it. No, I mean I I'm not I'm be I'll be brutally honest, I don't actually watch Comet Relief really anymore. Um just I don't know. It's just never I, you're talking to somebody that that doesn't watch a lot of modern television. So oh, for oh, me, I am not I'm oh. I'm not gonna get the jokes. But I don't know. I mean there comes a point, I suppose really it comes down to the, the case of from this from this moment now anything that i experience and it comes up with that now that we have this level of not tolerating something in my opinion is wrong when it comes to something maybe 10 years ago at, 10 years ago is a case i think of like that was pushing the mark a bit then perhaps that was a bad idea 
but you know i don't know i mean certainly now you, you just don't put up with it anymore that's the difference but it's a it's a tough one you know yeah, i think it's all to do with context and nuance isn't it I mean, uh, uh, which is largely lost on the internet these days. You know, people see something, they think it's wrong, and they name call and they try to cancel someone, you know. Um, so I can't answer specifically about that sketch because, as I've said, I, can't, I don't remember it, so I don't think I even saw it. it but it, it, I think you can't set a year cutoff point. <laughs> you can't say it's 10 years and that's it. It's nine years. It's 50. It's 14 point three years it, it's to do with what is being said and how we feel about it now and and how it was done I, in short it's a complete nightmare and there are no rules about it and what is happening on social media at the moment is that the the debate on things like this is convulsing and I mean that in the truest sense of the, sense of the word convulsing, like it's mixing up and it's going around in all sorts of erratic that, and nobody quite knows it. And some people think they're right. Other people think they're right. And they clash and they, you know, it, it is quite unedifying to watch and really damaging to be involved in. And, you know, I, I don't get involved in any of those things. Now, uh, those of you who, who are kind enough to follow me probably realize that I hardly ever post anything on Twitter. I just retweet a couple of things but i hardly ever say anything i don't originate material and my facebook page i you know i promote the benji and nick show on my official facebook page and on my um personal one i just put silly pictures of my shed uh and occasionally oh and also on my official one i love if i see lovely colorized pictures from old doctor who i just whack those on there because i love them uh and that's it and i find that if i just put one of those on there with no comment i just get you know uh a huge amount of interaction and it's glorious because no one's trying to make um you know no one's cross about anything because i've not done anything to make anyone cross uh but having said all that i am so close to just completely cancelling all my social media because i don't know how much i want to look at any of this stuff anymore you know the the arguments really i'm not saying that anyone's right or anyone's wrong i'm just saying that the bitter it's like a street knife fight a lot of it you know it's so vile isn't it it's a difficult one you know as i always say to end this and move on to happier things yes. um in the internet now it's like if somebody said to me would you get rid of the internet i would say no if somebody said to me if you could just have it never exist in the first place i would say yes that is my answer to this i hate the internet but unfortunately it's the way life is it's given me some great opportunities to connect with people work with people and meet people and it's all very exciting but had that never happened i'd probably be a happier person and i think we'd all be a lot happier talking of happy people um yes. shelly dean from across the seas here from the holodeck herself is present with us so let's invite the shell star into Yay. the mix Hey now. Shelly, hey. what's activity happening? Look at that. Oh, brilliant. She it's is wearing my yeah. penny in for a penny in for a pound uh cosplay for the uh show that we are discussing today. Yes, it, it works. She's, she's gone she's gone for an, from a, a series one style mm -hmm. rimmer. Yeah. She's got an H on her forehead. I'll just explain that for people who can't see this, okay? okay? I cut out an H from some uh, holographic. Sparkly. It's actually holographic paper. And, uh, How appropriate. And I am a holograph, so I have passed on, and I am now a holograph. So, Brilliant. The irony uh, is I swapped it out for some, um, some special glue, and she can't actually get it off. It's stunned. It's been there for two <laughs> weeks now. Oh, um, look. Because that's going to drive me crazy. So, oh, my God, okay. you're not a hologram. It was a lie. I'm oh. back to life, ladies and gentlemen. I found the planet <laughs> that Rimmer was looking for. Uh, or this the is, aliens. Of course, all referring to Red Dwarf, yes, which we'll be Red discussing Dwarf. later. Well, very soon, I think. Actually, very right soon. now. <laughs> oh, right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're, right we're having a bit of a... We're having a bit of a shake up, Nick. Um, you know oh, yes, this one, but I, but let, but we are gonna, uh, you know, we will say to people, if you want to watch along with us, then do check us out on our Patreon. Um, all the benefits you'll be able to find it by searching patreon.com forward slash the Benji Nick Show. Um, you can find mm -hmm. us on there. Loads of fun things. Yeah. We've got a Discord which is now open. You can watch videos of us have cookery things. It's very exciting. Uh, oh. Keeping that nice and brief you here because uh, we don't want to seem like we're hard selling stuff. Um, although you can buy Benji and Nick show mugs and t-shirts. <laughs> um, 
which is hard selling. Do it yeah, now. We haven't got Don't our mugs. We now. were going to get some mugs, weren't we? They must be on there. My way. mug, my my mug arrived this morning, but um, I can't drink out of it because um, it's in the dishwasher. I wanted to wash it. You know, can't just drink a mug that's that's randomly turned just up. Just rinse it. You, what's the matter with you? Use a tap. Well, it's not it was, like it's dish- used. Somebody made well, it. They didn't just take yeah, it out of your just, cupboard you, and give it to you. Well, I, look, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I'm just scared saying. Of the microbes. Yes. I am scared of the microbes. What can I say? You don't know. You just don't know. Do you? you just they don't do, know. They I'm do just... suggest for you to wash things yeah, when I they're do. new but like a that. A dishwasher. So I, I have never owned a dishwasher. Never, ever. Well, I've life. I've got a dishwasher, and if you own one, you probably use it. So I the could. Answer. I don't think I would ever live anywhere else the rest of my life without a dishwasher and central air and heat. So dishwashing is great. <laughs> I hate washing Sh- just, dishes so much. Just shove it in the dishwasher. Oh, it's just yeah. done. It's done. And then, it's not but my then problem you have to now. unload it, it, and it and all has bits fun stuck fun. on it, and it never. No, not washes. when you have a good not dishwasher. My dishwasher. No. Oh, I'm just See, thinking that's, of one of the studios. See, this is, yeah, this is the man who's not owned a dishwasher, therefore only has a bad opinion of the dishwasher. Yeah. That's true. See. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's my, my thoughts on the matter. But um, I, I would say this, this appears to be horribly sexist and stereotypical, but my wife is an incessant washer upper. You, you can't stop her from doing it. And that is not me putting any sort of. She, she, it's almost like, you know, the last bit of cake is on the plate and she's trying to get the plate off you before you finished. <laughs> That's something my mum has said. She said she tries to get the plate off you before you finished. She's just well, she can't, better that than she does you know. it. She's got no patience for leaving dirty washing up around. Now she, I could use her at my house. So you well, want to send her on over Steph. to New Jersey? Then if I'll she goes to her. a house, if she visits a house and there's washing up to be done, she will just go and do it. Doesn't matter whose house it is, she'll just start <laughs> doing the washing up. Yeah, there's a friend of ours who's quite untidy with that sort of stuff, and when we've been around there, she just Steph just goes over to the sink, turns the tap on, starts washing up. And they say, you don't have to do that. She goes, yes, Yes, I do. I I can hear her saying that. Yes, yes, I do. (laughs) So there you go. Anyway, I didn't expect to be talking about washing up. Um, Shelley, are you going to give us a sort of factoid thing about uh, Red Dwarf? I am. So straight from Wikipedia, it's (laughs) Red Dwarf is a British science fiction comedy franchise created by Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, which yeah. primarily consists of a television sitcom that aired on BBC Two between 1988 and 1999, and then on Dave, yeah. which I had to look up because that okay. just Name, named after that the character out of Dave me, Lister as which well. Is, right. So since 19, or since I'm sorry, 2009, it's been on Dave, uh, which has then gained a cult following. The premise of the series follows the low-ranking technician Dave Lister on board the spacecraft Red Dwarf, who awakens after being in suspended animation for three million years to find he is the last living human with no crew other than Rimmer, a hologram of Lister's (laughs) deceased bunkmate, and Cat, a life form which evolved from Lister's pregnant cat. (laughs) There you go. If you just read that, you go, (laughs) what? How? How? (laughs) So uh, we what we're covering today essentially was uh, series three, episode one, which is called Backwards. And the synopsis is as Rimmer is taken Crichton for his pilot's test in a space vehicle, they find themselves being sucked into a time hole and end up on an alternate Earth where time runs backwards. Uh, Lister and Cat follow them to try to rescue them. Um, Our uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Colin Smith, who does the covers for the Benji and Nick show, wrote an interesting email about that, which I should read out. Uh, He says, if I can focus on it at this distance with my glasses. Uh, (laughs) Hello, Steph. No, Here is being the classic Red Dwarf episode backwards, a kind of soft reboot for the show with a new Holly played by Hattie Hayridge, who previously played Hilly, the female counterpart in the series two episode parallel universe and Robert Llewellyn Crichton. As a new main character, another actor, David Ross, played him in series two as a one-off character in the episode Crichton. And then he says, honestly, I could bang on about Red Dwarf for ages, but I'm here to deliver the cover, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, it's interesting, though. This. So what we've picked, what I think, Benji, you picked this. It's a soft reboot. They they decided to have a real... Uh, but but um, 
Shelley decided she was going to watch the first episode. And I dare say you've watched the whole first series now. And you? second. And second. <laughs> yeah. I, I watched the first. I'll shut up in a minute and let someone else speak. But I watched the first episode again. And then I watched a bit of the second episode. And then I went to backwards. But over to you, Shelley or Benji, anyone who's not Nick Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start since I'm the newbie to the whole Red yeah. Dwarf universe. And I did. I, I started from the beginning and decided I'm going to keep watching. And I absolutely loved everything in the first series. And in the second series, I just I just laughed along, thought it was fantastic. Um, and then when I got to the the one that we're talking about today, I found myself torn because i was i was impressed by the changes that they made to the production value yes yes which was massive it was like going from 1940 to or actually out here's even better it was wizard of oz black and white to color it was yeah. like so drastic the difference in the production value do you think it was more money came in oh yeah it yeah looked like more money it looked like they decided to up the ante didn't definitely it? um but the story itself was not my favorite. Um, I thought it was a one trick pony joke that went on for 30 minutes and it would have been great had there been less of it. I mean, I get it. We're in a back, backwards nah, world. Yeah, Everybody's more, reverse, but it was like the same joke over and over yeah, yeah. and over. And, yeah. you know, for me that it just, I, I thought they could have done better, as yeah. as we're saying. This is the soft. Did reboot. you watch the re Did you watch the rest of uh, series three? No, not yet. I'm no. halfway through the second episode. I think this is possibly the worst episode of series three, actually, in my view. I love you see. I love this episode purely. Well, I th I think it's interesting because I remember watching Red Dwarf through. Uh, I bought the DVDs to watch the earlier stuff because it was on. But then it was it was you know this when it was on when I started watching it it was already well underway. Yeah. Um, so I went back and I remember watching this first episode. And for me, I just thought, like you said, it was a soft reboot. I thought, oh, this is a bit more, there's a bit more to it. It feels a little bit more, there's a bit more moving and shaking. Um, yeah, I can under, I can totally understand what you're saying, Shelley, about this. It is like a, a one trick pony. Although the one thing I would say is, I think what saves it though, is the fact that it's executed really well. Like it's actually, it's used in quite a fun way. And I think it is, you know, there are loads of amusing little moments. There. Even like, you know, L the London sign is the wrong way around. Nod, the nod, shots of them, nod. you know, nod, nod, and them walking. Through long streets. <laughs> you know, the beers sort of thing. And the idea that, the, you know, they got, get a job, was it the Fabulous Backwards Brothers or something? Yeah. <laughs> you know? the reverse like, Brothers. The Reverse that's Brothers, it that's called. it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, quite, I quite like that because it's just sort of very stupid solution to a problem. I mean, well, to be I, very dull, yeah. I find that the, the the logic of the whole backwards thing is not consistent in the story. I mean, yeah. it, they, they break their own rules. And I know it's just a silly comedy, so it doesn't really matter. But it's a, sh a shame they couldn't have been slightly cleverer about it. I mean, the, the fact that, you know, they've been in this world, uh, Crichton and Rimmer have been in this world for quite some time, being the Three reverse weeks, brothers. I think it Three was. Weeks, okay. And it still hasn't occurred to them that things that don't make so sense mean that the things that, uh, instigate it are happening later they're thinking oh why is he doing this and you think because you've been here for three weeks so why you know i think that they could they should have either pointed up their stupidity at not understanding the thing that they've been experiencing for three weeks or done it better yeah. and uh you know and it's like oh someone's going to eat something in reverse and it's going to be a bit gross and the audience goes oh you wonder because it was performed in front of a live audience those bits they must have had to play in on a screen uh for people yeah i suppose so I suppose so and, and, and that, that would have been funny once yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like, okay, we're going to have, have the same way of joke. Doing, right. Yeah, it was the same joke over it, and over. Yeah. And, and I, I kept. I found it consistently amusing. But <laughs> Well, Steve, I, one of the things I wrote down in my notes when I was watching it, it was this is the, for a 12 year old boy's sense of humor. <laughs> no well, offense, Benji, but. Yeah, but but, 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 but we're really... all trying to, in my opinion, you we're all trying to. It? Probably. No, I don't know. But I think the thing is, though, we're all trying to essentially put sensible rules on something that's meant to be completely daft it's meant to be like 20 25 minutes of just utter stupidity so i don't i don't think i don't think it you know it's it's like it's like saying you know why isn't 
uh, Scooby Doo. Why doesn't Scooby Doo have the same mystery solving techniques as something like Cracker? You know, yeah, it's just yeah. it's just not it's not meant well, no, to be taken I mean, literally. I, it refers to any manufacturer of dairy products. No, that's life of Brian. <laughs> um, it's just you, you know, know I just I think it's say fun. That. I did it's say fun. that. I did say it was just a silly thing, and I, I suppose I just think. I mean, Scooby Doo is uh, for kids, and this is meant to be for grown ups, right? And it because it's quite adult in its humour, and I think that I think that if it had been a bit more intelligent in what it did. I think I think they could have been even funnier if they'd really. Yeah, yeah I think they, there there is grounds just, to do more. They, they proved sort of, they it. They sort of cop out and kind of go, "Oh, it's something like this, isn't it?" You know. But they've proved that they've been able to write with that sense of humor, that silly, ridiculous, crazy, nonsensical humor, for the twelve episodes that were before this. Yes. And so I just felt like it was they they relied too heavily on the the reversed film you know because basically that's what they're doing you know every i was i kept reading everyone's like oh the fight scene the fight scene was just so spectacular i'm like they shot it well they shot it and then they played it and back played it backwards so it wasn't there wasn't any fancy (laughs) trickery as far as it goes it was just it was just backwards it's it's just in the uk we never tire of watching people walking no it was fun no i'm not i'm not criticizing the sh- the episode because i did enjoy it i watched it twice but i just felt like i know that the writers have the ability to make things funny without yes, driving yes. it and pushing it and making well uh, what i <laughs> yes, want to say is this is is that my this is my theory i don't know if it's true folks but um i think that series one and two did really really well and they thought and the, the program makers said, let's spend more money on this and make it more mainstream. I think you can get a bigger audience. It's been getting a much bigger audience than we ever expected. Let's make it even bigger. So we'll spend more money on it. And guys, when you write it, can you make its appeal broader? Just kind of make it more daft so that anyone can laugh at it and not it's just channel find... s- switches, isn't it? It's what? Well, it's it's that you, I didn't hear what you said. Nail, Sorry, you've, it said it's for cha- it's for channel switchers. You know, you've hit the nail on the head. There is yeah, that when yeah. people are flicking through, they're flicking there, turn it on, and you see some daft backwards fight scene. You're going to stay on because you're thinking, what is this? And then yeah, you yeah, and then so. so no matter when somebody switches into this episode, they're going to get a, a bit of that rather than if they'd have got like series one or two. Which is two which people is chatting funny. on a bunk. It's, yeah. it's people chatting in an echoey spaceship and and some you know it's quite dry at times. I mean it's funny, but I th- I think there I think Red Dwarf are better when when they're on location or doing something silly like this or the, you know there are some fab episodes like um, Dwayne Dibley you know that when they wake up from a simulation Dwayne they Dibley, think, yeah, yeah they, you're actually Dwayne Dwayne Dibley. I'm Dwayne yeah. Dibley. You know, yeah, they're, they're in uh, a simulation, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it is, there's some fab concepts. Yeah, it's not, I, I completely agree. It's not their most um, ambitious, I, but I think they told them to brush with a broader brush, you know, to write with a broader brush. I think they, you know what I mean? And I really, it really surprised me because my, I had the received wisdom in my head because I hadn't really known much about Red Dwarf until the third season. And I was working at Starburst magazine and we got contact, contacted by Peter Tyler, who was the cinematographer, director of photography for the special effects. And he said, look, we're doing new brilliant special effects of Red Dwarf. I can give you bits of film and you can blow up the images and have a mate. And there was not much British science fiction around at the time. So we we embraced it as this, you know, almost a bit like Doctor Who because it had great model shots in it. And, you know, I remember that being the exciting thing. And the received wisdom being that the first two series were a bit beige. They had beige uniforms. It was a literally bit beige. beige. Yeah, a, very dark bit, and I gritty. A, yeah. I had a vague memory of trying to watch episode one, thinking, "Why is this weird, dull beige program with people thinking they're funny?" But going back and watching it again, I loved episode one. I thought it was really good. It was like discovering a hidden gem. And the only reason I didn't carry on watching series one is because, funnily enough, I'm quite busy. And I thought I'd better get on with watching the thing we're supposed to be watching. And I had trouble watching backwards. I stopped a couple of times and went away and then thought, oh, I must go back to that. Whereas episode one, you couldn't stop me watching it. So it's interesting. It's the reverse of what I thought. But I will go back and watch the rest of 
the third series because I remember because of all the special effects shots and the fact that we went in and interviewed the special effects people and I met them all, lovely bunch of people, and saw all the models and everything. I was fascinated to watch season three at the time and I'll be fascinated to see it again. Yeah, well, well like I, I watched conclusion. the first two series because I enjoyed it so much. So that's why when when it came to watching this one, the, the first of the third, I was like, oh, like it just it just kind of left me kind of like, oh, because it, it was it was brighter. It was colorful. It was just the production, the, the sets, everything, costumes, everything changed. So you you got brought in and I literally because it was like I spent <laughs> what? 12 hours, six hours, however many hours it was watching the first two series, like straight. I binged it completely. And then boom, right into this. It was like, whoa, you know, the, the, it was, it was jarring how different the, it was visually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I will say, I really enjoy that the, uh, they brought, uh, they changed Holly into a female because it definitely needed some female energy. And I'm looking forward to, because she was only in it for like There's not much energy seconds. from Hattie Hayridge. <laughs> the whole performance is just like that. But it's a female. I love it. I love it. Because in it. every other episode, the females tended to be the butt of the joke or the yeah, sexual yeah, harassment yeah. kind of you know thing. So it, it just it's just nice to have a, a woman on board. She only ended up doing it because the the guy who did it, what was his name? Uh, uh, oh. Rob. Well, whatever his name it. was. He didn't want to do it anymore. Well, he he moved away and wanted to do it remotely and wanted to be paid the same. I think that's what it was. And they were like, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, you need to instant, come in. <laughs> and they had an instant solution because they'd introduced Hilly before. So they thought, mm -hmm. let's do that. Yeah. I, I and she's really good. A nice, yeah. And she's, and she's a, a lovely nice. person. Yes. Yeah, she I is met nice. her at yes. cons. Yeah. She's, she's a lovely lady. Really, yeah. really nice. nice and it was funny good. because I knew her I when I met her. I've never seen this. So I didn't know her as this character. And so then what, you know, but everyone was like, Oh my God, she's from red dwarf and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, cause that meant nothing to me, but now you've got, a, you've got a ride. You've got a ride. You will, you will enjoy it. There's so many yeah, I'm looking good forward episodes to it. Yeah. coming up and it red dwarf is one of those things. It just gains momentum. It has a few misses later on when they go back to, well, I'm not going to spoil it for you cause it is a journey, but there is one, uh, series which is just in my opinion a bit duff but then it had the amazing thing it yeah when they go back they go back to the ship and the they, they recast Kachansky, don't they yes. yes they do yeah and they can recast her with the woman from crime traveler <laughs> well, i mean it was a poor idea right from the start wasn't it <laughs> um but you know it is one of those things we'll touch upon this really briefly it's one of those shows uh shelly that you know, it's it finished. Red Dwarf finished, and that was that, and everybody moved on. Uh, you know, Craig Charles went on. He was in Corrie for years, Coronation, Coronation Street. Street. <laughs> you know, um, the the cats, uh, uh, Jules, what's his name? Danny uh, John Jules. Yeah, he's been in a million things. You know, they've all gone on to do other character. stuff. I love the cat character. So the cat much. is the cat is is an absolute absolute dude uh, you know everybody uh, of course Kreiter went on to do scrap eat challenge and uh <laughs> and also got really into um into he, remember this was years and years ago do you, remember, you know like james corden does the um those drive things where he drives and peter Carpool k drives karaoke. yeah well interestingly enough uh what's the chap's name who's Crichton? i'm so bad with names you know this robert Llewellyn. Um, robert no, Llewellyn. The, yeah robert Llewellyn. yeah Robert Llewellyn was doing this first. He this way before them. He he started doing these car journeys on YouTube. Um, I think it was called his carpool or something. And I think because he was really interested in like uh like renewable energy and cars that aren't bad for the environment. And he started doing this and driving people around. And it's really interesting how and it took off and did quite well, but it's interesting how it's kind of been forgotten. And now we just think, oh, like it's that thing that James Corden and Peter Kay do. But but he started it, in my opinion. I don't well, know. Jerry maybe Seinfeld they, maybe... does one too. Everybody does it now. But it was... cars Robert Llewellyn did it first. Great. I don't even know what you're talking about. Just to never say. mind it. But it's just Pete. <laughs> no, you know, no, just I driving. Don't need in... to know. But anyway, so the show died, and then they brought it back because you know Dave is the channel na named after Dave Lister, and they managed to do to bring it back on there. And and it, I think it came back originally 
they 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 didn't know quite where it was going to go. I think they did a special, which interestingly enough, they went to Coronation Street, um, <laughs> and um, and it just took off, and it's still running at the moment. You know, they're still doing more Red Dwarf, which is just. I just think it's great that it's got not just yeah. a revival, but an authentic revival that's not rubbish, and the fact that it's just you know it's still enjoyed and loved. Yeah, that's yeah. Like Doctor fans, Who in that in that. The fans vein. brought it back. The fans yeah. brought Red Dwarf back. They didn't bring Doctor Who back, but the fans brought Red Dwarf back. I think they lost one of the writers, didn't they? I think it's only the latter ones are only written by one. Doug Naylor, I think, does it now, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. There you go. All right, it's then, a really so good show. Are, I, what are the marks? For the show as a whole, I'm going to, so far, I'm going to give it a five exclamation, exclamation marks. Mark. Uh, for this episode, I'll say a uh, three. That's what I'm going to say. Five and five, baby. Five all yeah. round. Love it. Love it. Red Dwarf. Perfect, perfect <laughs> tellies. Get, grab yourself a, a four packer, a Stella Artois. Get yourself a oh, curry yeah. on the go. Just kick back. A vindaloo. Watch it has to be a prawn vindaloo. It has to be a prawn <laughs> vindaloo. Kick back, watch Red Dwarf. What more do you need in life? It's so, yeah, a smegging good time. It's a smegging good time. <laughs> oh, dear. I, I've got it. What is the uh, the episode where they try to get Crichton to say smeghead? And he can't say it, and he just keeps going, Smeeg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shmeeg. Shmeeg. It was really funny. Um, I uh, give the entire series uh, four exclamation marks, and I give this episode uh, uh, three exclamation marks. Yeah, Safe bets. We like yeah. a safe yeah. bet around here. Well, from me, Benji B, it could be. Oh, we haven't said what, what we're going to we be doing, doing next week, week, are we? What are we doing next week? Very anxious to leave, isn't it? Should we finish... Inferno? No, we can't because I think Nick's flying all over the place doing crazy things. So yeah, I don't okay. think he's going to be able to get hold of Inferno. That, that, you know, that was my thought as well. You know, okay. but but uh, but yes, I may not have the bandwidth to do it. <laughs> so what are we going to do? The do I'm telling you, interesting. One. I don't know. Um, 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 have I watched anything interesting that I can possibly? Uh, I mean, we can try to do How about Inferno. Cracker? Didn't we say that I should watch that? Crackers is great. I could just talk about Cracker. I don't even need to see it. I know it so well. <laughs> I know Cracker so well. Nick's looking tentative. I th I just had a feeling tentative. we've done it before. I think you and you. I think we have done it before, Nick. I yes. haven't. Maybe but Shelley hasn't. But maybe we should do something new just to keep the keep the listeners invested. In us, what Nick's well, like? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've lost, I've lost the election. No, sorry, um, it's, there's such a delay on this internet. It's really, it's almost like we're not having a conversation. It's kind of it's really bizarre. I, I it's completely, just... completely fine for me. No, because you're the slowest one. <laughs> Probably. Well, okay, let's do Cracker then. First episode of Cracker sounds good to me. Um, but yeah, let's do it. From me, Benji B, it's good B. And for me, Nick B, it's good B. And for me, Shelly D, it's bye. And don't forget to... The Benji and Nick Show starred Benji Clifford, Nicholas Briggs, and Shelly D. Walter's mother was played by David Kay. Baines was played by Jay Dermott. Series was devised by Michael Young. Musical advisor was James Roadhaver. Historical advisor was Carl Bate. Film cameraman was David Tremont. Studio Lighting by Chris David Designer Fatina G. Issa Directed and produced by Jeffrey Bailden This has been a Red Raygun Limited production Cut you off, Shelley. You can continue before we end this broadcast I love All her. I was saying was go get your merch at nicholasprigs.com forward slash shop if you want to pick up some Benji and Nick show merchandise uh...